before we get into the show, make sure to do a couple things. First of all, click the subscribe button down below and make sure to turn on your notifications, please, in order to get updated content that I start to put out. I do put out weekly videos, so hopefully you enjoy those. The second thing you can do is to make sure to be empathetic and understanding for all of my guests that come on this show, but otherwise, enjoy the show. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Deep Dives into the Minds of Esports. My name is Blake Panashevitz, and today's guest is a contenders coach who is an Australian coach who has worked with Europe and North America. This is his first face cam reveal ever, so you guys should feel very luckily that it's coming from my show. He's a previous coach for a second win that took a third, fourth place vision, a finish in the season three contenders, and now he is the head coach of Gladiators Legion. Please let me introduce Thomas Mock, maybe better known as Maid. Welcome. Uh, good day, um, the traditional Australian uh, greeting from my homeland uh, there. Um, probably the best way to start this off. Good day. Is, isn't it like nighttime there? Um, it is, in fact, uh, 11 a.m. in the morning. Oh, okay. okay. So, but you're in the future, right? It's 410 now? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it is the, the fourth month and the tenth day of the fourth month uh, okay. in the year of our Lord uh, at Odonai uh, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> so uh I, i'm i'm excited to kind of get into this um we 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 were talking beforehand and we we're i was like listen you got to have a face camp there's no option with that that is like my one of my steadfast rules we need to see your beautiful face i'm happy we get to see it um uh, and we're gonna go through a lot of like what it what what makes you you because you're a very interesting character and only people only ever know you by like your Twitter, which is a picture of I don't know what to be honest. Uh, either I'm not anime enough, or uh, I just don't know. But like you're definitely a name out there that people kind of know, and you really kind of cemented yourself as being a, a coach with uh, I would say probably second win though. You do have obviously previous experience before that um, in the Australian scene, in the Europe scene, and so we're gonna kind of go through a lot of stuff. But I always like to start off my shows very, very easy. Um, and so with you, uh, coming from Australia, I felt like it was fitting to ask, uh, Vegemite sandwich? Is it good? What's it taste like? Um, okay, so you're not, you're not meant to have it like as a sandwich. It's entirely like on toast. Um, you cook up your toast, a uh, layer of butter, um, very thin layer of Vegemite. Um, and then you go from there. It's okay. Not a what, what does Vegemite taste like? Like describe Vegemite for the, cause I, when I see it, I think of, is this like a Nutella? Is this a peanut butter? Okay. Like imagine you have Nutella, but it's extremely salty. And uh, there you have it. That's uh, that sounds terrible. I mean, it, it's an acquired taste. I mean, Americans like lots of disgusting things and I don't call you out for it. Wait, like what? Um, uh, yeah, that's what I thought. Sure, I, sure <laughs> I can think of something uh, that's not off the top of my head at, uh, at the second. Oh, yeah, that's because we like all... Okay, that's not true. There are some things that Americans probably like that is not uh, good, like uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Oysters are not particularly... Uh, sound appeasing so but those are uh i think they're bowl balls that people eat it's doesn't sound um, particularly. Is, is, is that an american thing like intrinsically yeah, yeah, yeah. or is it is no it comes from down south it's a uh, southern yeah, food that huh. yeah, huh. yeah. Huh. i'm not yeah, i mean i don't know if you can call that down. normal america but it's <laughs> it is what it definitely is definitely american i mean all, all, all power to them if they want to eat the, the the testicles of um large uh, uh, herbivore then uh, go ahead <laughs> uh, <mind> Dutch. <laughs> so uh that kind of brings up an interesting uh question because you're you're from australia right and yeah. you're currently in australia right now which i'm that's going to bring up some questions i'm gonna have for you later on looking more at like the esports side of things but what is australia like um okay so i like i like to think of it as uh like think of the us and then think of uh, the us 20 years ago it, it, it's it's basically bad. Um, I, I don't live in the desert. I, I do not uh, see scorpions or snakes or spiders on a daily basis. I live a uh, disgustingly normal uh, suburban lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Where do you live in Australia? Uh, I live down south in Melbourne. So uh, just before the Tasman Sea. Because mm -hmm. I've heard that... Uh uh, like Australia is very much uh, a huge continent, or not... Uh, it, I mean, it is kind of a, uh, a huge area that there's basically two uh, very big metropolitan areas, but between not being there, it's basically you have to drive for like hundreds of miles to get places. Um, yeah, that would definitely be a very sort of like 
that sort of like the correct uh, opinion on Australia. Uh, it is a lot of um, well, a very small amount of like a lot of stuff, and then a lot of nothing there mm-hmm. uh, in between them. So, did you go to school in Australia too? Then I take it, born and raised in Australia. Yeah, um, I lived a couple of years in New Zealand, but uh, yeah, mostly Australia. Yeah. Don't people get uh, New Zealand and Australia mixed up all the time? And uh, isn't there like some beef between, uh, uh, like, if you if you call someone from uh, New Zealand like an Australian and Australian <laughs> in New Zealand? Um, I think it gets mostly friendly. I think I think New Zealand's like finally come to terms with being like a shitty third world country that's nowhere on par with uh, Australia. I mean, and good on them. I mean, everyone has to be honest with themselves, and it's good that New Zealand is honest about being number two. Okay, okay. The hot takes were made. I like it. Um, so what was school like in in Australia? Um, very. I want to say like very, very white. I went to like school. It's like ninety nine percent white people, and it was just very like middle class suburban people. Mm-hmm. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Uh, yeah, I have an older brother and I have a younger brother. Okay. What's the, what's the age difference between the three of you? Um, I can't remember how old my older brother is. Um, he think he's 30? Fuck. I feel, I feel like a bad fucking brother. Well, like, you in know my, which in, brother is the important one? I mean, in, in, in my defense, I don't know how old my mom is either. Um, which is... Probably better for her because I don't get to tell her how old she she's is. But, um, 20. No. She's yeah, twenty. Yeah, she's she's eternally twenty. Um, but no, uh, my younger brother's what twenty three. Jeez, I feel like a bad fucking sibling. I'm so sorry, but they have to find out this way. Okay, that I mean, don't worry. They probably won't watch the show, so you're probably okay. Like, I hope not. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. I I don't know how much they're into like Overwatch and stuff like that. I guess that would be the the uh the kind of deciding factor of whether or not they watch this so uh what was what was school like for you did you go to a big school did you go to a small school no i went i went to like um a smaller religious school uh and um i don't know like, like, a I don't know, like school? Aunt, no i went to a uh, jewish school actually oh are you jewish yeah i guess it's, i mean it doesn't particularly matter now but um yeah, I guess. Okay. So, sorry, do you follow Jewish practices now or no? Yeah, I mean, I just I just don't eat a lot of bacon. Um, I eat a lot of other things, um, as you can tell, but not a lot of bacon. Okay. So, uh, you go you go to this. I I've never, to be honest, I've never heard of a Jewish private school. Uh, in the states, you only hear of really like Catholic private schools tend to be more prominent, but. Uh, I also grew up in a very, very small area that was very secluded from everywhere else, so that might be why. Yeah. Um, kind of interesting. So, what was uh, school like for you? You mentioned that it was very white, so there wasn't a lot of diversity, it sounds like. Um, no. Uh, uh, were you good at school? Um, no. I Okay, so, I was. I feel like I was decent at school, and in about in year 12, um, I discovered video games, and it uh, all went downhill from there. Okay, so let's, uh, let's let's get into this. Let's go before before uh, before twelve, right? Let's look at that a little bit. Uh, did you get along with people inside your school? Yeah, I, I don't think I was. Oh, actually, I was. I mean, I'm kind of a terrible human. I always have been, but um, I get along with people uh, fairly much okay. fine there. What What do you mean, terrible human? Were you, Were you Were you a bully? Were you You were a bully, were you? No, a little no, bit. You a little bit. Every, everyone is. I think everyone. No, um, no, this is not true. Everyone is not a bully. <laughs> I wasn't a bully. <laughs> I was probably I'm, that I poor, mean, cor- poor dorky kid. You were like, oh, look at look at Blake there, looking like a, a a little tiny child who doesn't age at all. <laughs> no, I mean, I it, I think it was more complicated than that. Like, I I, I definitely had sort of like incidents, but I wouldn't categorize myself as like necessarily a bully. I think it's sort of like a more three-dimensional uh thing than that but i would say like looking back at it i I definitely did things like i'm not proud of uh now okay so so you have to understand that like a lot of video games tends to be younger kids 
right, who are kind of look up to uh, Overwatch pros to some degree as like kind of like even idols. And I think this falls in with coaching staff, too. So what were some of these things that you regret? Um, I don't know, just like being rude to people. Um, are definitely like a lot of slurs, which were probably uh, more socially acceptable at the time, but um, are definitely not now, which I won't repeat. Yeah. Um, but it, it was it was a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, just like I don't know, like a lot of like being like an idiot teenager. Yeah. Yeah. So you was there ever any like uh, so your school? How did they how did they respond? Is it like so? So like I went to a school where basically that stuff was functionally allowed, and even like fights to some degree were pretty much like I remember one time a kid got his like face bashed in with an ice chunk because I grew up uh, in the north, and he had to get, oh my god, he had, to, he had to get stitches, and uh, we had a class of like twenty kids, and so everyone knew who did it. Okay, and no one would say anything because first of all. Uh, we didn't want to get beat up uh but also you didn't say anything and uh like nothing was going to happen anyways you knew that even if they did find him the worst that would happen is he gets suspended for three days and then he'd come back to school and beat you up so it was like nope don't know who did it i so, mean it, i mean it, it was like a private school so it was like uh it wasn't necessarily allowed like we never had anything that was like uh that bad <laughs> Um, I'm trying to remember like the worst incidents. No, it was, it was never like anyone like physical fights of that. It was all just like like snarky rumors mm-hmm. and just like people being like shit humans to each other. Uh, give or take. So kind of like Reddit. Yeah, basically, um, Reddit oh. is high school. Okay, Reddit is high school. Sorry, all the Reddit people, if you're watching this. Actually, I'm not really that sorry. You deserve this. Um, I mean, no, Reddit, Reddit, Reddit is a terrible, terrible website. Yeah. So, um, why did you go to private school? Um, so obviously, uh, my parents wanted to give me like a semi-religious, uh, upbringing. So the result of that was that we went to a school which provided that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you talk about like religion, it almost sounds like it's a nonchalant thing. Like, are you a, are you a practicing Jew or are you just kind of like, uh, sort of practicing Jew or... Um, I'm, I'm very like non-practicing for me. Like at this point, it's like more of a cultural thing than okay. not necessarily like a religious thing. Um, <laughs> this is because like, I, I'm not really like in a kind of like institution or a place in my life where I necessarily like, I am exposed to that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. So, so you're growing up, um, uh, re- I, like just looking at like what we've talked a little bit and what I've seen on Twitter, I imagine you were the class clown. Like, oh, if, no, I, yeah. no. if I had to pick a, is that accurate? Is that what, who you were? Yeah, I, I was an enormous shitlord. Um, as I said, uh, I was definitely the class clown. Like, I enjoy saying dumb and funny shit, and I uh, enjoy making people laugh. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> so you're you're growing up, and you mentioned you turn twelve and you start to get into video games. Oh no 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 not like year twelve. So I was like seventeen oh. or eighteen. Oh, 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 wow, you went a long time without fighting, like, video yeah, games. Yeah, I, I, I legitimately didn't have um, internet uh, at home till I was about 16 or 17, so I never actually had access to the internet. Okay, that, that makes kind of sense. So what did you do up until that point? Were you someone who was uh, playing in sports? Were you... Yeah, uh, I played a lot of sports. I did a lot of reading, um, sort of, like, more, like, traditional nerd stuff. It's like, uh, we were on... You're probably a little bit young for this, or no, no, you'd probably know, like, dial-up for, like... I'm, I'm 27, so... You, you know what dial-up is, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, we had dial-up. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, my, my home was on dial-up to about, Ooh. I was about 16. Because, I mean, internet infrastructure in Australia is just fucking... I've heard terrible. it's very bad. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a thing. So, yeah, I didn't have internet, so I didn't play, like, online games, so I wasn't really, uh, whatever. I came to it late, I guess. Mm-hmm. Which um explains why like, I can't aim now because I never had that head start of like being you know a hyperactive twelve year old on the computer. Mm-hmm. So so you're doing normal uh, uh like uh, stuff like reading playing. So what kind of sports did you play? Um, played a ton of soccer, swam, swim, swam. I don't know how to swim. say it. I can't pronounce words. Uh, yeah, swim. Mm-hmm. Uh, soccer. Uh, played a bunch of rugby. Um got incredibly injured a few times but uh yeah what's what's the worst injury 
Um, I had my hand broken, which uh, wasn't particularly fun. No. Stuck my hand in a snowblower, so I feel you on uh, messing up your hand. Yeah. Uh, so, so you're you're going through school. What were your grades like? Were you were you you mentioned that you were kind of like were you like an okay student? Were you like semi decent? I, 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 I think like I was an okay student. Like I don't think I've ever been like an, uh, extremely like sort of like intellectual or sort of like studious student there. <laughs> um, definitely, um, I don't know. Like it, it it wasn't particularly for me, and I don't think I learned particularly well in like a super. Uh, intellectual environment there mm-hmm. um which, which is kind of like weird because like i really enjoy reading and i really enjoy sort of like pod review and kind of like the more intellectual aspects of overwatch yeah but um i think sort of like how i did it and sort of like the confines of and my yeah, oh, there we go um yeah um i think i was just sort of like in a weird environment of school where it didn't particularly work for me mm-hmm. um and then yeah, year twelve, I discovered uh, video games. Um, I got my first like proper internet connection. I got my first proper computer. Um, my friends recommended a game called uh, Team Fortress Two to me, mm-hmm. and um, almost like immediately, I became uh, hooked to it. Um, within sort of, like six months, I joined my first competitive team. I was scrimming every night. I was like really, really into it, and I sort of like lost focus on school from there. Hmm. Okay, so. Uh, you mentioned you get into TF2, which TF2 didn't have, it had some of a pro scene, but it was fairly small and not really serious or everything I've heard from like people who, who have been kind of involved in it. Um, so you're on year 12 and you're starting to play, uh, video games and your grades are starting to drop. I imagine quite, 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 quite a lot. Uh, at yeah, this point. I mean, yeah, fair amount there. Um, okay. I think like in, in, in pure hindsight, uh, sort of like objectively looking back at it if if i could go back and sort of like talk to myself i'd tell myself like don't go fucking play video games it's a bad idea um actually get good grades go do something for yourself go do something with your life but i mean we're here yeah so so what were your parents like were they were they okay with uh with the whole video Um, game thing because that's something i've seen with a lot of pro players so their parents are like oh no this shit isn't happening I think both of my parents were uh, very sort of like absent. Um, so to like some extent, I was sort of like just allowed to do whatever I want, mm-hmm. um, which part meant just playing fucking video games for four hours a night. Yeah. So, uh, odd question, but this is something that uh, is actually fairly. Uh, it's kind of rare for a lot of families nowadays to actually stay together. Did your parents uh, stay together? Uh, throughout your entire time, are they still together? Uh, no, my parents divorced when I was what ten. Okay. Um, like for for various reasons, which I, I mean, I prefer not to get into because it's kind of personal. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah well, like I, my dad wasn't. Yeah, my dad wasn't really in my life, and my mom was kind of absent as well, sort of like emotionally, I guess. Okay. So, so starting at a very young age, you pretty much. It sounds like you had to do a lot of raising yourself. Yeah, um, I, if, if not like physically, sort of like mentally and emotionally, I sort of like mm-hmm. had to work stuff out for my own. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, you, we don't have to go into any of the reasons of like why your parents divorced or anything like that. What was that effect on you? Because my parents, so I actually come from a very, very odd situation where my parents divorced when I was six. Um, they both got remarried and then they divorced again. Uh, uh, like, so I come from a triple divorce home, kind of a very odd uh I know, right? Kind of fucked up. Yeah. Um, the, so, so, but I, re- I remember mom. being kind of young and uh, going through, and I was a lot more mature for my age. And I remember being kind of a very stressful thing going on. Uh, was it something that was a, a stressful thing for you? Something that was kind of hard for you to go through? Um, I mean, I, I definitely don't think I was like a mature person than like other people on my year level, but um, it was definitely stressful, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, without like getting into it too much. Do you remember how you handled it? Um, I think just of, like being in the class count and then like throwing myself into video games because it was sort of like an environment where like I don't know it was just easy like people just didn't care. Mm-hmm. It was just like you were you were there for like your skill or like what you could do. Yeah. So and you mentioned your dad hasn't really been part of your life then. No, he hasn't. 
Okay. Was was that something hard to go through? Like to know that he wasn't he wasn't really around. Um, I think many many aspects are like having parental figures is very like detrimental. Um, but it's what it is. Yeah, I mean it it is what it is. But like you have to remember that like all these people are. Uh, like go through everyone goes through different things and i think that that's what's really unique about people in esports is you're actually there that like you've made it to some degree you look at where you are now like you're on you're on gladiators legion maybe it's not owl yet and obviously you have more steps that you want to probably get to um but you've you've come from this uh australia this giant country of nothingness where there is a. Uh, like two major cities and a bunch of uh, empty space, um, yeah. and you've you've worked your way up through the the Overwatch scene, uh, working on a ton of different teams, and so you you have a very unique opportunity to like let people know that hey, bad shit happens to bad people, and that's kind of something I've always um, been a proponent of is let's let's try to help everyone we can with our with our life, right? Um, but that's understandable. So you end up getting to. Uh, your last year of school, um, and you're playing uh, video games all the time. You're getting into TF2. Uh, was college ever something that was in your mind? Um, I, I think it was like definitely like an expectation for me. So like I finished year twelve, my grades aren't that bad, but and I immediately enroll enroll in something. And within like the first three weeks, I realized like I'm not interested in this per se. What did you like, do in enroll? I'd rather just um, I did media studies off memory. Mm-hmm. And I decided it, it it was just like something I wasn't interested in. Um, like I I didn't enjoy like the huge amounts of travel I had to do each day because like I I did it's, uh, went to a university within a city, but like it was an hour on the train like each way there and from, and mm-hmm. I sort of felt like this this disconnected from sort of like the process there. Like I didn't know people. I wasn't having fun. Um, I didn't feel like personally invested in this in the same way I did into video games. So it uh, didn't make sense and impulsively i just wanted to play more video games yeah so what ended up happening you're there for three weeks do you drop out yeah i, I dropped out first year um and then like over the next couple of years um i did like different stuff like i attempted again um i ended up finishing like a bachelor mm-hmm. so not a bachelor <coughs> uh a Associates. diploma of Oh, right. Right. Yeah, and associates of like media um, and television. So I actually do have like some kind of like formal degree. Um, so I mean, that's good, but there's just there's no jobs in media in Australia. So um, there's yeah. that. So so you end up uh, your first year, you end up dropping. What happens when you drop out? What do you do? Do you just go back um, home? Yeah, I go back home and I sit in my room for twelve hours a day and I play video. Okay. Was your was your mom okay with that? Was she like, "Oh, what are you doing with your life?" Because I imagine that I would have been a lot of tension. Yeah, I, I I I think she was like very understanding and sort of like that regard. I think like there was obviously like some frustration with like what I was doing with my life, but um, I think she understood the like I even if she didn't know how to like deal with it or have like a solution to it, she understood that I was like deeply unhappy with like where I was and like what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So do you think that you went through any sort of like uh depression where you're just like, I don't know what to do with my life or uh, were you like confused about what, what you should do at that point of your life? Was it something where you were like, I, I want to play video games was professional gaming in your head. Like. So I, I think the thing like th- this was like very early. So I mean, yeah, this was very early. So sort of, like in the space of like so this would have been what 2013 2014 so that is kind of starcraft there yeah like csgo is becoming but like a bigger league thing of legends like yeah. yeah league of legends was out yeah but i mean that, that was never really on my radar but like e- e- esports like esports like wasn't a thing in my mind like competing was like a thing in my mind in like video games mm-hmm. if it's like if i'm able to sort of like split those two into different things there um, so like, like, see, like, yeah, Overwatch, Overwatch was like a competitive game, not Overwatch, sorry, uh, TF2 was a competitive game, but it wasn't an esport, if that makes sense there. Yeah. Like, people were competing against each other, um, for sort of like pride, there was like no money involved, et cetera, et cetera there. And, um, that's like what I wanted to do. And that's what like I found, uh, solace and comfort in, because it's something that made sense to me. Mm-hmm. Were you any good at TF2? I'm pretty all right. Okay, like, like, were you, if if there would have been an esports scene, could you have been a pro at it? 
Um, I think possibly I'm um, like looking a bit like back at like the way I approach stuff and like the way I approach stuff, like based on my current mentality. Um, I think I approach like a lot of like how I practiced, um, how I thought about the game, like what I did very badly. But, um, I think, yeah, I think I could have been. Okay. So, so you mentioned approaching things very badly and the way that you kind of took things. What was, what was that approach and how have you kind of learned from that? Like, what is your approach now? Cause you, you're obviously looking back and you're a coach now. So the, the ability to kind of like look back and be like, Oh God, I was an idiot. And if I would have done this, this, and this, it would have been so much better. Like, it's like looking back at like a, a young player and being like, dude, you, you need to stop doing that. So what was, what was your approach, uh, back then? Um, I, I think it was like very non-focused. Like, um, I don't think I took things seriously. I never like reflected upon like what I was doing and sort of like objectively looked at like how I could, Mm -hmm. uh, do things better. Um, I think like a lot of like the way I got better was like definitely by rote over sort of like actively like getting rid of like bad things in my gameplay, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, so was that something that you did for was that something that was just uh, video game related or is that kind of like your entire life? Like the way that you kind of approach things? Um, I think definitely for like a few years. Um, but I think like outside of video games, like I never really like hard approached anything or really tried to like stick things out with a lot of things. <laughs> um, definitely like very uh, suboptimal. But um, I, I've definitely like taken like a different approach within uh, Overwatch in my life since playing yeah. Overwatch. I mean, you've you've gotten the experience. You're much older than you were then. Uh, yeah. He's he's 25. Everyone, if you're curious, uh, I'm still older. Uh, so <laughs> we're just gonna run that in a little bit here. Uh, so, but you don't get called a girl. So I mean, there's that. Like that's something that no, uh, I don't yeah. have long hair. Yeah, so it's uh, it's like the the little blessing you have uh, in your life. Uh, so uh, kind of looking at that, uh, you're doing TF2. Um, you took the uh, you said it was a year off, right? Yeah, and then it turned into another year, and then mm-hmm. another year, and that kind of thing. There, like I I, I think I spent. Um, I mean, like one year I did attempt. I I did my like associates or like diploma or whatever. Yeah. Um. But like, I, I just like sat there and I played TF2 and I sort of like digressed, or sort of like, yeah, nothing moved on in my life just because. I mean, I guess like TF2 was like a dead end as well. Yeah. So were you were you not taking like when you make it sound like it, it sounds like you weren't really taking care of yourself either because I mean you mentioned that you used to do a ton of sports and stuff like that. Um, they used to swim as well as play soccer. Um, and I imagine that once you uh, got into college, all that pretty much stopped, right? Yeah, I, I, I just stopped um, interacting with the world like outside of video games. Like video games are sort of like my entire life. Mm-hmm. Um, so like when, when, I, when I bring back sort of like if in year 12, like if I could go back and tell myself like don't play video games, like um, I, I think like my life would be like radically different for the better just because I wouldn't have had that sort of like half decade of sort of like regression mm-hmm. and sort of like uselessness okay uh do you feel like um uh, like kind of looking back at like at that now that um th- that would be considered what you would call a low point in your life do you think that those five years were like the low point of like your life yeah i'd, I'd, I'd definitely say so um i think it's like very weird to almost like say like i i regret playing like video games so, like I guess, like, given, like, what I would do, I'd say, like, most people say, like, video games have been a very positive thing in my life. But um, mm-hmm. I think for the longest time, no, video games were a very, very negative thing upon my life there. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it sounds like you used them mostly to escape from the world, like, to to avoid um, everything that was out there because it was the, the one place where you were getting some sort of satisfaction from it. Yeah, I think so. I think that actually I think that's fairly common like everyone says like oh video games but a lot of pro players that I've talked to um, and even some that I've had on my show there's like a specific age where they actually start to get into um, video games at an extreme normally it's between like um, somewhere between like 14 and 17 normally where they something happens it doesn't always have to be negative Um, some of it is just really negative Uh, and it basically they shift from having some sort of social life to just playing video games all the time so 
one of the things that you were kind of, uh, like you were someone who got along and had like some sort of standing in school. Did you have a lot of friends from school? Like um, even looking I, at like high school or. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I was alone about like any strength. I definitely didn't have like a huge group of friends, but like we had like a smaller year level. Yeah. I think there was like 50 people in like my year level. And I had about like four or five people that I was like pretty good friends with. And then sort of like wider circle of like people I talked to sort of like regularly, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so when you, when you leave uh, high school and you're going to university and you start to play video games more, did you basically cut all these people out of your life? Um, I think to like a large extent I did. Um, I definitely have like a few people I'm still like very, very close to from high school. Mm-hmm. Are you there? Like, like this wider community or like making new friends or sort of like being a social human, um, yeah. as a full thing. Yeah. So you, you start playing video games and you take you how many years was it that you you basically just stayed at home and played video games before you kind of had any sort of direction in your life? Um, I'd I'd five maybe six. So um, from I, like I, eighteen I, to, yeah. to like twenty three. Yeah, twenty three, twenty four. To about the time for like Overwatch came up, and then like Overwatch for me was sort of like this clean break where, um, it had sort of like a lot of hype around and it was like something that I wanted to pursue. So like I moved over immediately. Um, and I think it was just like that sort of infrastructure there within there to like yeah. make my dreams come true. or sort of like push me competitively. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you first get into Overwatch, are you thinking, okay, I've been playing TF2. I've been fairly good at TF2. I'm going to become a pro in Overwatch. Or were you thinking, uh, I'm a little bit old. I just want to be a coach. No, I, I, I definitely wanted to be, like, a pro player myself. And, f- like, the first, like, eight, ten months of the game, like, um, that was, like, what I tried to do. Um, mm-hmm. And I definitely, like, came to the conclusion where, like, I don't have um, sort of the drive I did when I was, like, 16 to 18 where I can play 12 hours of the game a day um, and it, it makes me feel good. Like now, like I, I feel like exhausted after four hours and I need to like stagger myself. Um, so I definitely think it became like one of those things where like becoming a staff member, um, was probably like the way I remained competitive over being a player. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't there for me anymore. Mm-hmm. So you start looking at getting into, uh, Overwatch and you start, uh, looking at coaching and you coached, um, a lot of different teams actually like you had a fair amount of teams um <coughs> the, the stuff that i have says you started coaching right around uh, 2017 you went through like seven different teams before ending up on legion right from monopoly cub to athletico camo uh to dark sided team singularity um and pretty much all of these were either i would say t2 and maybe even some t3 teams depending on how you'd rate them compared to now um so what were these what were these teams like and what did you kind of learn from the experience were you always in australia first of all did you remote coach all of these teams um so uh, yeah i've i'm I still am i guess because i haven't got my p1 visa but um yeah i've always been a remote coach um, I think the the thing about like my first three teams is they're actually basically the same team. It was just like name swapping or being picked up by an org. Like okay. I joined um, Monopoly Club as their, their team VOD recorder, um, and I sort of like morphed into the manager and the coach. Um, and then we got picked up by Atletico, and then um, Atletico like stiffed us for a bunch of money. Um, so like, the team split up into two, and I joined with half the team to Duck Sided. And then um, I ended up like, not getting along with a bunch of people on the dark side of that thing, which I think was like on me being sort of like an emotional person um, and a bit over the top. And I ended up kicking me, so I was like, oh, fuck. So I went to Europe. And um, by complete luck, a European contenders team picked me up and I learned a fuck ton about the game mm-hmm. as a result and about like how to do things. Mm-hmm. So no, uh, the, your your team that swapped uh, like names and orgs the first few times was an Australian team. Um, so you've had a lot of experience in Australia, uh, some experience in Europe and in North America. What is the Australian scene like comparative to both Europe and North America? No, oh, it's it's a steaming shithole. Okay. Okay. So I mean, I I, I I love my boys, but like the fact of the matter is, it, Australia like is the wild west in terms of like esports. 
Like, uh-huh. it is very underground. There's no money there. Like, you're still at the stage where there's a bunch of, like, predatory orgs that will take advantage of you, yeah. and you're not being paid for your time. And so this happened with Athletico then? Yeah. Okay, what what was the story behind that? How did they screw out of any money? Did you get any... Uh, were you able to go back and try to get that money? Did you try to sue them? What's the story behind that? Um, so I think I have to give us, like, context here. Um, so the team I was on, sort of, like, Monopoly Club, a.k.a. which became, like, Athletico Camo, had, like, a bunch of um, 14 to 16-year-olds first. So it was a very young team. Um, but we got we got picked up, like, under the proviso that uh, Athletico was going to provide um, support for land for us. So flights plus like accommodation, um, and as we qualified for land and like these events came closer, mm-hmm. um, it became like very obviously that Athletico was uh, putting off paying for um, our accommodation and our flights. And uh, since we had like a bunch of like very young players, um, I began we become under a lot of pressure, just sort of like as that staff member to like help out and it came to the week of it so it's like we, we need to fly out to land on friday there and on tuesday or wednesday there they still haven't paid for our accommodation or they've paid for our flights there mm-hmm. um so stuff like that and it ends up being there like on the thursday like um me and the team captain half have to like force through like paying for accommodation because like we're not confident that the org will actually come through with what they promised there yeah um so it, it ended up being like a lot of land was just uh me and the team captain paying for all the things um and then it took a long long time after that to get our money back mm-hmm. but they they eventually paid back uh all the way did they were did they have you guys on like supposed sla- salaries were they supposed to be paying you guys uh-huh. like uh, actual things, or was it mostly they're just paying for flights to to lands in prize money? Um, we were we were under contract, but none of us had um salaries. But like the the contracts like stipulated like land plus accommodation, and that's what we read verbally. And it was I mean it's scary last minute not being able to know if you're gonna make this kind of like competition just because your org just isn't giving you what they promised. Yeah. So now, and I mean. Get- no, go ahead. I was gonna say, like, um, all fairness, to, like Athletico, like Athletico has changed management since then, and as I'm aware, like the current Athletico management is like pretty good. Okay, that's that's good I'm to not, know. Not, not not engaging in slander into like Athletico management. No, no, that's fine. Um, and that's just something that happened to you a while ago. So like, definitely, like things have could have changed uh, since then of course so you go from uh the australian teams and i i imagine you come to some sort of realization that oh if i ever want to get anywhere i probably can't ever work with an australian team like realistically so yeah I'm, you- I, I mean yeah there's, there's this big like war it's like you can only get so good in this because there's only so much competition and mm-hmm. at some point you can like hold your nose and you're gonna jump in and you're gonna go international okay. um and that's what i did Mm-hmm. So, so you go to uh, Europe team. Um, were you a paid uh, person for that, or did you work for free with the uh, Europe team? Uh, no. So, um, I ended up on Singularity, um, and Singularity would start at three or four a.m. for me. So, I'd be waking up every day at three or four a.m. to coach um, an all Danish language team. So, uh, none of them spoke English and scrims. Um, they all spoke Danish and scrims, um, yeah. which made it very hard. Were you um, able to I, coach effectively at all with that team? I don't think so. I think, like, most of, like, what I did was sort of, like, retrospective, like, of the scrims. So, like, Mm -hmm. we would do a scrim, like, I'd watch, and then afterwards I'd have, like, a bunch of notes in English, which they had to go over. But um, I think, like, as, as, like, a coach, I don't think it helped me grow, but I think, like, as as someone, like, checking my processes and, like, how I presented stuff, I think it definitely did help me grow. And, like, I I love all the people from the team. Like, they were all great guys. It's just they all spoke Danish. Unlucky. Okay, so you move from Team Singularity to uh, Eminent, and you're an analyst now, which it sounds like you were actually probably more of an analyst with uh, Team Singularity, like, realistically. Yeah, realistically, probably, yeah. Probably probably more of an analyst. So you go to uh, Eminent. Um, What was that like? 
Um, it was like a very, very short term thing. It was yep. basically just for like a month. They're helping them get through trials. Um, they didn't. So I found myself like out of a job because I mean, I'm the team there anymore, but, um, I don't know. Like, I, I think like eminent showed me just like how effective, like a head coach can be. Yeah. Um, and that's what I went, learned from there. Like, um, the head coach for that team, like Blizzard is very strong. Like he, he's this like typical Brooklyn dude. Like he's very commanding. He has like a booming voice. He's very like in control of the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, it taught me like how effective, like being a head coach can be. So, so going from there, um, this is this next team is probably one of the teams that has like some of the most articles about you that you write about. It's Conga Esports. Um, uh, it, at least there's a lot of writing on you. There was a lot more PR, and I do believe you actually won some tournaments with them. Um, yeah, I've double checked. Um, <laughs> uh, what was that like? What was Conga Esports like comparative to the other? Um, Kanga Esports. Kanga, Kanga. Yeah, My bad. Kanga, Kanga. My bad. <laughs> Um, so no, Kanga, Kanga was just like me being in a, yeah, I want to work. I don't have any opportunities overseas. So like, I need to reassess and I need to come back to Australia and I need to bring all these ideas that I've seen and that I've witnessed and that I've been a part of, and I need to bring them together, like into my own thought pattern and mm -hmm. like my process, so, like my process is like a head coach and like how I do things. Yeah. So, so was, were, were you getting paid on this team? Um, yeah, I did get paid. Okay. I, I, uh, like, because, like, yeah. like, if you look at, like, contenders now, like, everyone, like, I feel like a lot of people think that contenders teams, like, get paid. And you look at teams like Second Wind, you look at teams like Second Generation now, uh, Chicken Contendies, I believe. Um, you look at all these teams, <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the staff, at the very least, are not getting paid on these teams. Right. Like, no. Um. No. Most of these teams, like, if, if if they do get paid, it's in the form of, sort of like having a stipend out of team earnings or whatever. But yeah. no. But like the expe expectation is that like volunteer position. Yeah. So so you do end up uh, working with. Uh, oh God, I can't say their name right. Um, Kanga. Kanga. There we go. It's the, the Kanga. Hard a. Yeah, hard, eh? Uh, can't get used to it. So you go there, and you get done, and Second Wind is coming up. Like, how did you get into Second Wind? Because Second Wind is where I think you made a lot of your name. Uh, at least that's what I would say. Second Wind was, I would say, one of the catalysts for May that really helped propel, propel you being one of the, the better coaches out there. Okay, so Second Wind is kind of interesting because when I was in, like, before I was on Kanga, I trialed for Second Wind. Um, and during the season a little bit when I was in Kanka, um, and I actually was so frustrated with like how they played, like I tilted out of my trial and turned my internet off and um, dodged them. But um, fortunately, Justin was <laughs> able to give me a second chance there, like that second chance in the season to trial and sort of like be a part of the process. And um, with, you know, by luck, we managed to build like a pretty good roster that gels and that, like, I'm able to learn a ton off and, like, help teach in return. And mm -hmm. um, somehow we do it. Like, somehow we hit this, like, ride. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's okay. I don't edit these videos, so you're just going to have to deal, <laughs> deal with I mean, it. Yeah, just, someone's going to have to deal with this. Yeah. So uh, you you mentioned Justin. Now, for people who don't know, to the best of my knowledge, Justin works with uh, Atlanta, right? Like Atlanta. No, 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 not that, not that Justin. Okay. Definitely not. Uh, I'm thinking um, of uh, I'm thinking of Sky Fox, aren't I? Yeah, just, that's Everybody. Justin and Peach. This is this Everybody. is uh, second win Justin. He's okay. a completely different dude. Um, I don't think he'd enjoy being uh, mixed up with the other one. Actually. Clarification. I got the Justins. Clarification. Mixed up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, who, tell us a little bit about Justin. Where do these people come from that start up contenders teams um, <coughs> that uh, end up doing so well? Um, aren't like, do they have a spot in contenders at all? Because I look at contenders right now and I'm thinking, okay, Justin, I don't know how you're going to make money uh, on 
uh, contenders. Like, I don't know if it's possible to make money. I, I mean, I suppose if you paid for players and those players got bought, like their buyouts got taken out, uh, that might be the way. But even then, that sounds very uh, hard. So, like, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me your thoughts on that. Oh, um, I, I, I don't particularly think Justin's in it for the money. It's definitely sort of like a passion project for him. And it, it has to be with like, otherwise like, look, look, look at like how second on second win's been like two seasons in a row. Um, they've, they've sent like 10 people to, uh, Academy or, and like now two people to our, yeah, <coughs> like two second wins, like alumni are like now. So it, it's definitely always been about like talent for him and building time. Mm-hmm. Um, so so does he have does he have like uh because that roster like is he the one who makes up is he like the huck of of contenders right now like is he pulling people in and developing talent or is he just very good at scouting talent um um so i'd i'd, I'd have to give like some of the credit to Pew. it was definitely a joint job between Pew, who was like the assistant manager <laughs> um and uh justin and both of them are very very good at identifying talent very good at playing for talent and getting them onto team and like building these rosters like i think way more than me as head coach like they built the roster for okay not necessarily me beating like building the roster which i think is like very very important to like note because i don't think those do get like nearly enough credit for like what they do mm-hmm um, so they're, they're, like they're, bit, yeah. they're, they're, they're the ones who put everything together. They're the brains behind. Yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah definitely. Um, I think in like given, I think there's like definitely a space within them. But I, I, I feel like everything's against second wind here. Like the rules, the structure, like the thought pattern behind like all these teams. It's all designed to like not give second wind a fair go, or like they to like feed off second winds. Yeah. Like, I think without, like, major changes to, like, how Second Wind operates, all the rules, like, Second Wind is always going to remain what it is, which is sort of, like, a feeder team for Academy and Al. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there, yeah. there, is, there is probably going to come a, a time where they can't maintain, right? Like, they're doing a pretty good job maintaining now where they, well, I mean, people thought they were going to get kicked out or have to go through uh, relegations or whatever you want to call it um, last time. Yeah, and there was, like, a rule... Ch- I don't know if there was a rule change or Blizzard was like, oh, crap, we better not kick out this team that everyone loves so much um, that made it this far without any money. Um, like, and because like, that everyone thought that they were going to have to go through the entire open division, uh, like, uh, trial process again, and they didn't have to. But there is going to come a point, I think, where too much of their talent has been sucked away that it's going to be very hard, especially depending on when it happens. Um, I, I can't imagine that they can maintain what they've been able to maintain for that long with the rule set that's in there. Um, okay. So like my impression was that they was like, they were not going to be able to build a team this season that mm-hmm. be able to compete. And I definitely didn't think that that was fair, but based on my opinion, um, but they definitely proved me wrong. And I mean, my my gut still says the same sort of like future like iterations second wind but i mean it proved me wrong like each time and i'm happy to be proved wrong and i mean if 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 there's anyone who can draw blood from a stone from the talent stone it's it's justin and pew mm-hmm. and like i guess like flubby and weeds as well like they're 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 in the brain trust like in games of like teaching these players kind of whatever mm-hmm so, so you end up going uh, from second wind, and you end up leaving. Why did you leave second wind? Um, I I decided like at the end of second wind that like it, it it wasn't viable on my mental and like my my health to sort of like be waking up at these times and doing these kind of hours without like any kind of like recompense for me. Okay, so, so ended up, like, what, making... what were those hours? What were you doing? What did it look like? Um, so I'd wake up at about 6 a.m. and I'd do all my, like, work, and then about, like, 8 to 10 a.m. would start scrimming. It would scrim for, for, uh, through to about, like, 12 to 2. Mm-hmm. So, like, I, I was just, I was, like, doing, like, a time job without, like, pay, basically, at that point. Okay. And, like, I, I decided, like, uh, it wasn't worth the stress to like do that without like having some kind of like financial security for me Mm -hmm. um or relocation i think relocation was like more important in my mind yeah i mean i've I've been i've been doing this so long with pay 
Like, I, I can make that work. It's just a matter of, like, the hours themselves. And yeah. <laughs> so, you, you, do you talk about leaving Second Wind? Did you have anything... Did you have other opportunities out there, or was that a moment where you were like, do I want to continue doing this anymore? Yeah, um, it, it was definitely, like, a situation where, like, I put myself out there. I don't think I had anything lined up when I left, and I went, like, if, if I'm not doing like getting paid or like being relocated for season like i'm dumb mm -hmm. i'm not interested in doing another season there so that that um january like january this year was definitely like the make break moment and um uh happily enough like i made it mm -hmm. so you did make it which congratulations um but uh kind of like looking at that uh what did what what were other ideas you were thinking about doing did you have any other plans that like when you were in those moments of if i don't make this then i'm doing something else do you ever think about what that something else might have been um either go back to school or kill myself one of the two that is uh very melodramatic i mean it it was but like i i definitely felt moment like i basically failed and like i'd fucked up my life and i mean like yeah. my thought pattern is like where do i go from there mm -hmm. makes sense so so what was it like how did you get in touch with gladiators uh did they reach out to you where they're like damn we want this maid kid who uh like um I, so well. I, I i i don't know if it was bad but i definitely they reached out to me and sort of like had a very uh far uh, sort of like trial process and then um i don't know how exactly they chose people but obviously they chose me and like now i get to have like a wonderful bunch of people and panker <laughs> a wonderful bunch of people in panker so uh i mean obviously this season <coughs> probably isn't going as as well as you would like um probably um, um one of the i mean at the very least we could say that this entire time you've been stuck in australia yeah, right. um, I, I, I'm kind of, like, conflicted. Like, we haven't done as well as I would have wanted to, but I think we've kind of... Um, I've fulfilled, like, a secondary goal of getting, like, fried to Al, and he's, like, a player who went through with me with second win through trials, through second wins and contenders, and then, like, most of the season. And, like, now he's made that, and, like, that that's a big sort of, like, personal point of pride for me mm -hmm. in terms of, like, having gotten the player there. Um, I think we've also been under, sort of, like situations where it's been like we've had a bunch of players on radically different ping and um it has made it hard like i i definitely think i've made like a bunch of mistakes this season and there's like stuff i could do better mm -hmm. but i think like i've achieved like a bunch of secondary goals and i definitely think i'll be able to give them a second chance in playoffs this season to show what we have mm -hmm. so like, I, 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 yeah. what do you define so i had io stucks on here um and I kind of asked him uh, a very similar question. Um, it's like, what do you, what is your goal with your contenders team? Like, what is the goal with the team that you're running? Um, and for him, it was about developing talent. It was like, we don't really care about placement. It is quite literally about developing talent. And that seemed to be like one of the most important aspects for them is just, it's about developing talent. Which, <coughs> if you look at Boston in itself, makes a lot of sense in how much they pull from uh, their academy team and or they sell players. Like, it makes sense that they're looking at how do we build things up in order to uh, sell or trade later on and that's what well, I mean, he obviously still wants to win um, and that's something that's still important to him, but a lot of them is about developing players what is what is your kind of goal going into gladiators what is the goal of like the organization with their academy team are they looking to what are they trying to do um i i mean i i, I feel like glad would definitely sort of like um echo those values that like i stucks put out i i, I definitely think a lot of teams um sort of have this stance where like if, if they lose they go out and say well like winning doesn't matter and i think that's a very bad way to think about contenders mm -hmm. because contenders like at the end of the day is still a very very competitive league and yeah. that's what it's meant to be um and i think like denying that takes away from like the inherent uh what's the word whatever of that um so mm -hmm. For me, like winning and doing well within contenders is really fucking big for me mm -hmm. because um, I, I think like especially with second wind, like the reason people pay attention to second wind is because second wind keeps on fucking winning. Yeah, they keep winning like all these games. Like they're out there doing these things, and it makes people notice them. I think 
that's a really good way to get your players noticed as well. Like, if your players are out there winning, if they're doing it on no fucking budget, on no money, like if they're out there beating academy teams, like, they're doing well. Mm-hmm. Like, people will notice them. So, yeah, like, I, I, I definitely think that, like, developing talent is fair, but I think you market your talent the best. You give them the best chances when you win. Mm-hmm. So, so you're looking to win. Winning is the most important thing for you. Yeah, but it, okay. it, it's not the only thing. But yeah. I, I, I don't take like, this approach. Where, yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, IOSX didn't say it didn't matter, but it wasn't like the if you if you had to give like a list of five different things for him, it wasn't number one, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, I but, mean, I yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was gonna say like understand where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. So, so, I mean, when you when you kind of look at um, like how things have went so far, um, and this is kind of an interesting topic is like coaches they cannot force players to do things. Okay. Generally, they can only give tools, and you're also working remotely. Uh, is working remotely any of the reason why things haven't been going as well as you would have liked? Um. Okay. So, like, there's, there's definitely like approaches to certain things, but like, I would never do it. Like, I was in house, and I think like are inherently better just because you have like, you know, six players and you know, however many coaches like within the there. But um. I think, like, a lot of the reason, like, stuff hasn't gone so well is just because, like, I haven't implemented as well as I could do with, like, even with the tools that I have, and I take, like, full responsibility for that. Mm-hmm. Like, I did, like, a lot of soul-searching with, like, stuff that didn't work well for this season, um, and I've changed my approach, and, like, hopefully um, I get to do the same thing next season and sort of, like, take all these different approaches in this team house and, like, this team that I'm incredibly proud of, like, and I get to push it to the limit there because I definitely think they have the talent to be top of contenders. Mm-hmm. so uh that being said um uh how many chances do you think coaches should get like kind of looking through here because we i'm going to use mayhem as a good example okay. uh mayhem obviously last season they had an entire season four stages where things did not go well after those stages they decided to bring back the entire coaching staff or most of the coaching staff uh for, well, I mean that that's not true. Like the head coach went on to Al, and um, they went one success. It's not exactly the same thing. Yeah. Uh. Well, I mean, Mineral was there for uh, up till stage three. Then he kind of dropped out, and then he came back stage one. Yeah. Right. Um. May- mayhem. Mayhem's a weird one. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't. Don't think I necessarily agree with like how they approach things. Yeah, and I don't know their internal in terms of like how they think about coaching and like why they keep or why they don't keep a coach there. So I mean, it me like commenting on like any of that would very much just be like a guess. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not asking I, you to comment on man. Yeah. I'm asking you to comment on like the idea of a coach doing very bad for long. Like, at what point do you decide to? It, what point is it the player's fault versus the coach's fault? At what point is looking at gladiators right now? At what point is it just the player's fault, or how much of it falls on you? Um, I mean, I think like I wouldn't take really. like I think I could have had like five one or a six zero team. This mm-hmm. I fucked it up. Like it, it's end of day. Like me as a coach, like I have to take responsibility for how yeah. my players are. And like I failed them because they've lost games, which means I haven't been doing like the objective best that I could be doing. Mm-hmm. So, so my my thought process with that. Oh, yeah, right? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Like, Answer good. the actual question is I <laughs> I don't know. It it depends entirely like team to team to team to team. Mm-hmm. Like just what ma- like upper management was like yeah. the situation under like where they are. Um, it, there's so many different factors that it's impossible to give you some like an objective standard answer okay i mean that's fair so i just was kind of curious like because i mean i like if you look at containers uh like uh bettering talent you're looking at growing talent it makes a lot of sense that maybe you'd want to grow coaching talent too so maybe you try to um bring things in do you think that contenders is set up to develop talent and do you think it does a very good job at that um I was thinking about this. No, it's okay. I think it does have sort of like this talent there, and sort of like it builds talent. But mm-hmm. I, I, I think there's like this sort of like intrinsic conflict between um, contenders as sort of like a 
talent grow in contenders as a competitive uh, competition yeah. that at times conflicts with each other. Um, just in terms of like, I, I think like two player, two way players are like inherently non competitive. Um, just because like your second wins or your second gens or whatever don't have access to a two way player there, um, mm-hmm. that they can bring up like down from our, um, but I, I think that's like the inherent problem you have when you have like a system that has to cater to two things. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I think that like, I mean, arguably like amateur baseball, uh, right. Those, those are used to farm talent, but they also play games, but I think their yeah. primary goal is to farm talent. Um, they're trying to look and grow like that is a primary goal. And I always feel like with contenders, we don't really <laughs> know what that, that goal is, right? Cause if it was to farm talent, you probably wouldn't have any non Academy teams. Like realistically, you just wouldn't have any, um, you'd probably yeah, just I have- mean, that, that, that was going to be sort of like my next comment going forward, but I think like the ideal system would be a, like a franchise system, almost like a miniature franchise system, where it's just like these academy teams playing there within like the system that's like closed off. But I mean, like, was it, I mean, the, the contender system, like at the end of the day, it still, fun. It still does what it needs to do. Yeah. I have like complaints there, but I think Blizzard's still done a good job. And like, I'm thankful that Blizzard's created this opportunity for us to play in. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, it, is there any issues that you see with Overwatch? Like you looking at Overwatch, is there anything that like really kind of like worries you or kind of like scares you about uh, Overwatch? Um, I I mean like personally, like I'd I'd, I'd like to I like to see like the return of some like more mobile compositions. Um, and I definitely way Blizzard sort of like approach different things has like created a system or like this meta which has been um very like tank based which is to some extent like very non-mobile mm-hmm. um and I think like this patch in particular is heading towards bunker um but I personally would like to see like a more mobile I like I, I love movement I love movement and I would like to see that return <laughs> <laughs> okay so i actually only have one one last question for you unless you have other things you want to talk about your life that is made uh but uh my last question for you is arguably either the easiest or hardest question depending on who you are um so my last question you've had the experience of being on the show uh, it's been a ride an hour goes by quick um get got into a lot of things if you could pick any one person to be on this show the only uh caveats to that is they have to be involved in esports and they have to speak english because i do not speak other languages because i am uh not culture uh so I mean, they have, I have that problem too um so, i so, really do wish i could speak korean but um I oh god me too uh, but th- those are the only caveats uh they do not have to be involved with just overwatch they can be involved with uh league of legends csgo uh, fortnite rocket league whatever you so choose but if you could pick anyone to be on the show they don't have to be uh players they don't have to be casters they can be behind the scenes coaches managers i don't care <laughs> if you could pick any one person to have on the show who would you pick um the three the three names that came to mind one of them i think you already had on the show so alchemister I have um, not had I have not had Alchemist on the show yet. Uh, uh, well, yeah, it, if, it, if you want him on, he's a very interesting dude. I think he has very about video games. Yep. Um. Uh. I think Rolf. Um. Rolf's like definitely impressed me. Someone who's very like well and has sort of, like a very lot of intelligent things to say about the game. And um, the other one would be Harsha, just because I do love Harsha. Um. He's a big fuzzy wuzzy. Okay, Harsha. Okay, so we have uh, Jason, Rolf, and uh, Harsha. I'll, I'll let you have yeah. three. Though. Those are good ones. So that way, if one of them says no, I can look at the other ones. So uh, do yeah. you have any? Do you have any shoutouts? This is pretty much all the questions that I had for you. Do you have any shout? I don't normally do shoutouts, but if you want them, I'll give them to you. Um, no, I'm I'm totally okay. fine. I don't have anything else here. Uh, okay, so well, wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you taking some time to be here. It's been exciting. First face uh, reveal. Uh, I can't wait to try to figure out something with that. Uh, so it's been fun. Uh, but thank you so much for being on the show. And for everyone out there, this has been Deep Dives in the Minds of Esports. My name is Blake Panashevitz. And until next time, I hope everyone has a wonderful day.